We're going to be taking communion together at the end of this message. So if you have items at home to use for communion, please have those ready. This is the last week of this series that we've been going through on the book of Malachi called The Last Word. And as we've gone through this book of Malachi over the last few weeks, we have seen that there are several things that God's people are doing that he's frustrated with. He's pointed out that they're not even convinced that he loves them anymore. And because of that, they've gotten complacent in their obedience to him. They're bringing him sacrifices that aren't appropriate. The priests and the Levites are ignoring their responsibility to remind and instruct the people and what they're supposed to be doing. It was their job to preserve the message and the truth of God's word, and they were allowing it to just be ignored. The men of Israel had gotten distracted and their eyes had started wandering. They had been tempted to get into relationships with women from other surrounding nations. And they were not just ignoring the women in their own nation, they were actually even divorcing their Jewish wives to go and marry foreign women. And God was growing weary of hearing them complain that he wasn't blessing them the way that they wanted, and he wasn't punishing other people the way that they expected that he would. And they were even saying that it just wasn't worth it to follow God because his ways didn't work. But God wanted them to understand that even though they couldn't see it, even though they didn't understand his timing, he was at work and he was working out his plan and his promises to them. So I want to go back and look at the beginning of Malachi chapter 3 again as we begin this morning. Let's read Malachi 3 verse 1. It says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. There's an interesting word in that passage. Did you notice a word that kind of seemed to stand out? Isn't it interesting that God says, suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. He could have just said, then it will happen, or at this time this will happen. But he says that it's going to happen suddenly. And we know that God is never going to do anything out of his character. God is always going to do what's right, but God hardly ever does what's expected. So we need to be prepared when God is ready to act. Oftentimes when God's timing comes along, we don't see it clearly until it's right on us. Because when that time comes, then we can look back and we can see how he's been pre preparing us. But we usually don't understand that preparation while we're going through it. And I think that's what God is trying to tell his people in Malachi. And we are clearly given that same message in the New Testament. Romans 5, 2 through 5 says, And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also boast in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. There are a lot of scriptures in the entire Bible and in the New Testament about perseverance. And I think those scriptures are there because persevering is one of the hardest things for us to do. The Oxford English Dictionary defines perseverance as the quality of continuing to try to achieve a particular aim despite difficulty or delay in success. And when we look at the attitude of the people in Malachi's day, we see that perseverance is just what they needed. To them, it seemed like there was a delay in the success that they were looking for. But in the face of that delay, they hadn't shown perseverance. Instead, they had started to give up and to shrink their ideas about what God was capable of doing. And we have to be careful of doing the same thing. I'm glad I don't really see this in our church, but today in a lot of Christian circles, there seems to be a lot of complaining and worrying and doom and gloom kind of talk. And, and of course, there are some good reasons to be concerned. There are plenty of things that we need to be aware of and alert to. There are things that are just wrong in this world and things that we need to stand against and things that are really hard to know how to handle and navigate and approach with a Christ-like attitude. But what concerns me is that from a lot of Christian sources, I get the idea that the attitude is sort of like the people in Malachi's day. Just like God was calling the people in Malachi's day to per persevere through the waiting, he's calling us to be faithful today. And that's because our faithfulness prepares us for God's timing. 
I really believe that God is working right now and that he has even bigger and better things planned. And I believe that God works most effectively through people who are prepared for his timing. But like I said, for a lot of Christians, their attitude is either that it's not worth it to be completely faithful to God's expectations, that God is just okay with whatever we do, or they shrink their ideas of what God is capable of doing and they start to think we have to seal ourselves away and isolate ourselves from the world out of fear. And neither one of those things are what Jesus called us to do. In John 14, 21, Jesus said, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. So he's called us to be faithful and to obey his commands and not just the easy ones, not just the ones that make us feel good, but all of his commands, even the tough ones. And, and when we do that, Jesus says that we will see him more clearly. He says that he will show himself to us as we obey. And then in Matthew 5, 13 through 15, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So Jesus not only calls us to obedience, but he calls us to be obvious and public in our obedience, to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world through our actions of obedience to him. And that's where the people of Israel are failing in the days of Malachi. They're, they're not being obedient. They were not being an example to the nations around them. And because they were not being faithful, they were then unhappy with God's timing and his plan. They weren't ready. Next week, we're going to be starting our Advent season, building up toward Christmas and the events surrounding the birth of Jesus. And one thing that's very obvious in the Christmas story is that not many people were ready when the time came for the Son of God to be born. Just like God said in the first verses of Malachi chapter 3, the Lord they were seeking came suddenly, and they were surprised and caught off guard and they weren't ready. So we need to be sure that we're persevering, that we're not growing weary of obedience, and that we're not losing sight of our responsibility to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, because God is going to do unexpected things in sudden ways. And we don't want to miss out on the excitement and the fulfillment of being part of what God is doing. And when we look at the people that Malachi is writing to, even though there seems to be so many things that they're missing, God says there's, there's still hope. So let's read Malachi 3, verses 16 through 18. It says, then, then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them, just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And I will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Like I said, I believe that God works most effectively through people who are ready for his timing. And when we look at these verses here, I think we see just that. In this passage, we see a group of people in Israel who still have reverence for God and, and his sovereignty. And it says that they talked with each other. And what happens when they do that? It says that God listened and he heard them. God paid attention to what his faithful people were saying and he, he heard them. And, and what he heard when he listened to them was honoring to him. So we have to ask ourselves, what does God hear when he listens to us? We don't know exactly what these people were saying to each other, but I think there's a pretty good chance that they were encouraging each other. I think they were sharing stories, reminding each other of the ways that God had been faithful and, and just how much he had blessed them. I'm sure that a lot of you have a similar tradition to what our family does. But when we get together for Thanksgiving, like we did this last week, we sit down at the table and we go around one by one and explain something that we are thankful for. And for me, as my kids and my nephews and my niece have gotten older, it's been really cool to hear how the things that they're thankful for have changed. 
You can hear how they've matured, how they can see and recognize the blessings in their lives and and how God has been at work. And it's encouraging to sit with my family and hear about how faithful God has been. And I think that's what the faithful people in Israel are doing. So what does God hear when he listens to us? Does he hear encouragement or does he hear tearing down? Does he hear enthusiasm and excitement or does he hear is discouragement and frustration? Does he hear testimony and teaching? Or does he hear gossip and doubt? Ephesians 4, 29 through 32 gives us these instructions on how we should talk to each other. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And as we look back to Malachi, we see that God heard both complaining and praising from his people, but he listened and he responded to the people who trusted him and praised him. He made a distinction between those who were faithful and those who were rebellious. God says that those who are righteous will be called his special possession and that he will spare them and lift them up. And 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter tells us that we too can be found righteous, but not because of our own goodness or strength. But he tells us that our righteousness comes through Jesus. Just like the people in Israel in Malachi's day, we're going to make mistakes. We're, no matter how hard we try, we're not going to get it right all the time. We're going to get discouraged. We're going to say things we regret. We're going to treat each other badly. We're going to choose the wrong things. We're going to miss opportunities. And if it was up to our own ability, we would be in that group of people that God calls rebellious. But Peter says this in 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then in verse 9 and 10, he says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's not about our perfection. It's not about our faults and our failures or guilt or our shame. It's about Jesus. We do need to choose to be faithful to him. We do need to do everything we can to be obedient to him. But the way God sees us, the fact that he sees us as a royal priesthood and a special possession, that's all because of Jesus. And there's a distinction between us and other people, not because we're so much better and perfect, but because we've obeyed God in the most important decision ever to accept, to choose and accept the gift of forgiveness and salvation and redemption and new life that can only be be found in his son, Jesus Christ. And going back to Malachi, here's what God says about the remnant of people who remain faithful to him. In chapter four, God talks about how there will be a day of judgment and that day will be a day of destruction for those who are evil and disobedient. But in verse two through four, it says, but for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave to him at Horeb for all Israel. After most of the book of Malachi has been focused on the sins and the failures of the people of Israel, here God gives hope to those who are in his will. And what we see for us is the risen sun brings us healing. In the world, we all experience all kinds of pain. Well, we're going to suffer in this world and have scars, whether physical or emotional or mental, and we can share in the promise that God makes in this passage, the sun of righteousness has risen. And he offers us grace and mercy and healing and new life. And there's something in those verses that sounds kind of funny to us, but it's important. It says they will frolic like well-fed calves. And that comparison seems a little weird to us, but the people of Israel would have understood it. 
In their farming practice, calves were usually born during the winter and they would have been kept in their stalls and not allowed out into the fields until spring. The picture here is what God is saying is that there is freedom for the righteous in his kingdom. Because of Jesus, we can trust and know that what it means to be free. Free from regret and shame, free from our past mistakes, free to live in the light of God's love for us. And as we look at the last two verses of the Old Testament here, Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6, we see that God again points his people to the future and that he will keep his promises and work out his plan. Those verses say, See, I will send a prophet, send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Again, this prophecy is pointing to the coming of John the Baptist, the one who would prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. And when it says, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction, it doesn't mean that God is is weighing his options. It's not like he's saying, you know, I might send a messenger or else I might just destroy everything. It's actually a message of mercy. He's saying, I'm sending a messenger so that I don't have to destroy everything. And God did send that messenger. And Luke Chapter 1, an angel tells Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, what his son's purpose will be. And Luke 1.17 says, And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And John did prepare the way for the Lord. John called his people to repentance. He challenged authority. He, he drew a line in the sand just like Elijah. And God did send his son suddenly in a way that no one anticipated. And he won the world's greatest victory in a way that no one anticipated. By giving his life so that we can have hope. In Jesus, God chose not to destroy us, but to offer us hope. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So our hope is in Jesus, in this world and in eternity. So like that faithful remnant in the book of Malachi, I want to encourage you with words that we were commanded to encourage each other with. I want to remind you of the hope that we have and all that we have to be thankful for. In 1 Thessalonians 3, 16 through 18, Paul says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That's a message of hope and something that we have to be thankful for. So just like many of us sat down to dinner with friends and family this past week and remembered what we're thankful for, let's share a meal of gratitude and thankfulness as a family this morning as we remember the price that was paid to bring us true freedom and hope as we take the bread to remember the body of Jesus that was broken to pay for our sins. And we take the juice to remember his blood that was the price to give us hope of eternity. Let's pray. God, we are thankful. We are grateful for all that you've done. We're we're thankful for your patience with us. We're thankful that it's not our righteousness that that is the key, because if it was, we would fail. But thank you that you see us through Jesus, and in him you see us as righteous and clean and forgiven and worthy to be in your presence, worthy to be called your children. And that's an amazing gift that we could never earn on our own. And we pray that you'd help us to be faithful. Help us to be obedient to the things that Jesus told us to do. Help us to be ready. That our faithfulness would be, would make us ready when your timing comes. Because we want to be part of what you're doing. We want to be right in the middle of your will. So so help us to be obedient in a way that keeps us right there and keeps us ready. Because we know that you're going to do amazing things and, and probably in ways that we don't expect. So thank you for including us. Thank you for calling us to be your children. Thank you for 
loving us so much and showing us that love so clearly in Jesus. And we thank you in his name. Amen.